We're in uh, 2 Timothy, the second chapter. And before we do this, let's go back and review just a little bit. What's 2 Timothy about? Remember what 2 Timothy is about? Do you remember? What's 2 Timothy about? What's the name Timothy mean? Timotheus. Timotheus. Yes, young lady. Honorable to God. Timio, which means to honor, and Theos, God. Timotheus. That means to honor God. Uh, what kind of a person was Timothy? He was an invalid. He was a very, either an invalid or a semi-invalid person. Very, very sick. Um, uh, but he was a he was a warrior in the Lord. But he was a, a, an invalid. When I think of Timothy, I think of Dr. Carl Ferrar, Dr. Carl Ferrar, because he was a uh, about this tall. Uh, had muscular dystrophy since he was five years old, but a warrior in the Lord, and I mean a brilliant man. I mean, what do you, he could barely, barely walk um, with crutches and uh, uh, braces and things. And most of the time I saw him, he was in a wheelchair. But he served the Lord for 29 years of CMBI teaching at that school and he was in seminaries before that. But he was a warrior for the Lord. He was a real teacher of God's word. What does Paul mean? Paul, Paulos, He's, uh, Sharon, Shorty, short little guy. All right. Now, these are the things that Timothy talks about. He talks about the last days. He talks about heresy, uh, or Paul talks to Timothy about heresy coming up in the last days, wickedness coming up in the last days, uh, Antichrist. He tells to, uh, Timothy to be a good steward, to be a good soldier, to be a good athlete, to be a good farmer, uh, to be a good workman, and to be a vessel of honor and a servant of God. Those are the seven things he, he emphasizes that he uh, uh, wants him to do, and that's what he must do, even though he's an invalid. So you don't have to be strong and fast or anything like that to be a great servant of God. You can be a cripple. There's one girl, I think Johnny is her name, but she's Johnny's friends or something like Johnny and friends on the on the radio. She's a, uh, if I remember right, she fell out of bed and broke her neck. Oh, she dived. Dived. Dived into the. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, she broke her neck. Anyway, she's a quadriplegic. And uh, she is a leader. She leads. She's a very much encouragement to people. Brother Farrar, in one of the classes, he was talking about her so many years ago, back in the 1970s, that she was encouraging people like him. Now let's go on. We've uh, this is Paul. Oh, by the way, these are Paul's last words, will and testament to us. Paul's last will and testament to us. In verse number five, he's talking about being an athlete. We read the word athlete right out of the Greek word. If you um, <coughs> know English, uh, a lot of English comes from Greek, as we know. Eon, day, kai, athle, tis, u, stephanunte, eon, me, nomimos, athlete. Athelese. Quite a word there. That's where we get a word athlete. Athlete. What does this word mean, uh, Sharon? Athlete, yes. Um, it means to wrestle. To wrestle uh, naked. To wrestle naked. There, there's, you're wrestling, and when they're talking about this, these are the Greek games that they played in this wrestling uh, event. They were totally naked in this event, and they were uh, totally vulnerable to their opponent. That's the word that we're talking about. Are we vulnerable to our opponents? Constantly. We're vulnerable. Whose world do we live in? Lucifer's estate, don't we? But we are in the kingdom of God. We are administrators in the kingdom of God. So that is wonderful. We are in that little sphere. God always has a kingdom or administration in history and time on this earth. Even though Lucifer 
has causing all the problems in the world, the disease, everything you can think of. This is Lucifer. The storms, uh, the earthquakes, everything, all of this is caused by <coughs> the master of this land. <coughs> I used to get preach four hours without taking a drink or <coughs> coughing. <laughs> this is age for you, I guess. <coughs> if moreover also he may wrestle, and look at that word there, that word he may athale, athale. Sharon, can you conjugate that little verb for me there, athale? Right up there on the first line, fourth one over. It's third person singular. Third person. Yeah. Third person singular. Something active. <laughs> Present, <laughs> active, and subjunctive. Subjunctive mode. What does subjunctive mode tell us? Do it for ourselves. It's volition. Volition is there. I. <clears throat> this word is a real problem to the hyper Calvinist or the super lapsarians, because that word always talks about serving the Lord, coming to the Lord, whatever. It's always in the in the subjunctive mode, which means may or may not happen. The mode of doubtful affirmation is what it is. And a lot of times also in the middle voice, isn't it? When that comes right straight from within you. If anyone he may wrestle, anyone, and moreover, if anyone he may wrestle, and this is a uh, third class conditional here, condition, that's what you call a conditional particle, it's condition undetermined but with prospect of termination. It can happen, third class conditional. If anyone also he may wrestle, not he is crowned. Look at that word adverb of negation there, ook. Page 294 if you want to write that down. Adverb of negation, he says not lee. This not is active. Not he is crowned. Third person singular, present, indicative, and what? That's in the passive voice, isn't it? Passive means what? Something is done upon you. Not he may be crowned, except that lowered a may there. That's a little uh, uh, idiom, and it means unless no mimos. And this is a little adverb, no mimos, an adverb. That means lawfully, according to the tournament rules. According to the tournament, tournament rules. I've seen a lot of old pictures, you know, these old movies and things, and they'll have some some uh, boxing matches on there, and somebody will put a horseshoe in the in the whatever, you know. This that, is that legal? No. Like using brass knuckles in a in a fight, that's not legal, is it? Not a, you can't do that in the Olympics. You can't do that in your heavyweight champs, middleweight, featherweight, anything. Brass knuckles are not allowed. Simple as that. Well. If you won and they found that in your glove, you would be disqualified, wouldn't you? You'd get nothing. Remember when Mike Tyson bit uh, Holyfield's ear and bit part of his ear off because he was a brawler? What happened to him? What happened to Mike Tyson? He lost his, he couldn't box anymore. He was done, out. Why? Because he broke the rules. He broke the rules. Uh, Wyatt Earp was a referee and Wyatt Earp uh, always carried a gun that he called uh, My Little Pony. It was uh, My Little Pony. You know the Colt armies, you, you single action armies, they used to have a pony on them. And he had a five and a half inch barrel and, and a 45 and he used to keep it in, his, in a shoulder holster like that underneath his coat. Well, up there in uh, San Francisco, he was uh, refereeing this fight up there, and some of the people on the other side didn't like it. And he happened to bend over, and they saw this Colt pistol sticking in his in his uh, shoulder holster, and they tried to disqualify him because he's carrying a gun in the ring. <laughs> if he was, didn't carry a gun, he said, "I was undressed." <laughs> <laughs> didn't have anything. What he's doing? He wasn't going to shoot the guy. It was a match. You have to 
You have to play according to the rules. And then we have that athalese, athalese. Say that one, athalese. Third person singular, first air, subjunctive, active. Now, let's look at this from several different aspects, okay? First of all, how many ways of salvation are there? How many here? Uno, just one way of salvation. What's that? Salvation by what? Grace. By grace. How about Adam? Was he saved by grace? How about uh, Noah? Was Noah saved by grace? All right. How about Mose? Moshe, was he saved? Moses, was he saved by grace? Abraham was saved by grace? How about Paul? Now, we're talking about, look at this map up here. This is what we call, this is what we call a dispensational map. I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. Because I'm going to tell you something. Men only get saved one way. The Old Testament soteriology and the New Testament soteriology are the same. There aren't any multiple ways of salvation. There's only one way of salvation, period. Now, if you go to the Muslims, well, they tell you. There's five pillars in the Muslim faith. You've got to do these things. Do these things. you still got to go through hell unless you die in jihad. A Mormon, what is, the, what is, the, what is their idea of salvation? You got to, well, every, you know, you can't go to the highest heaven unless you're a Mormon. They, uh, <coughs> you got to go, you got to be a Mormon. And every Mormon male is a god in embryo. See, that's a little wrong. Isn't it? How many gods are there? How many gods? Hear, O Israel, or the Lord our God is Ahad. One. Not three either. We don't believe in three gods. We don't have Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost running around different directions. There's one God. We have a triune God. So many people believe in three gods. Some people believe in a thousand gods like Mormons. A million gods. Millions of gods. The Mormons will take you there to Genesis 126 and it says, See there, God said, Let us make man in our image. See there, there's more than one God. That's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How many gods are there? One. One God. Not three. One. Now, <clears throat> according to Mormonism, there's millions of gods out there. Millions of gods. How about uh, Catholic Church? How many gods do we have? Technically four. Mary. Mary, too. Yeah, Mary's a god, too. She's the mother of God. Mary the mother of God. Who do they pray to? Mary. Okay, we pray to Mary. You pray to Mary? You used to pray to Mary all the time, didn't you, young lady? All the time. All the time. Your prayers were to Mary. How would you say that? Mary? Okay. Yeah, you just rattle out. Oh, that's a rosary, isn't it? That's how you play. You pray according to the rosary. You pray according to this memorized theological saying. That's not going to work. Buddhism isn't going to work. Buddhism isn't going to work. Reincarnation isn't going to work. All of these different religions, Herbert Armstrong's religion, we can become like God. That's where we have, you know, he borrowed something from everybody, Herbert Armstrong did. He borrowed a little bit of Jehovah's Witness business. He borrowed a little bit of uh, Mormonism, borrowed a little Buddhism, borrowed a little bit of everything. Just rolled it up in what we call an eclectic religion. And Jehovah's Witnesses, what do you have to do to go to heaven? You're out. You're out. You can't go to heaven. Did you know that? Joe Wendish, you can't go to heaven. Why? Because 144,000 already there. You want to go to the kingdom. That's a millennial kingdom. That's where they're going to go. It's the wrong place. By the wrong avenue. Period. You're not going to get there. We all have to go through Jesus Christ. There's only one way of salvation. That's salvation now. Now, when you're saved, <coughs> we're in the uh, patria. 
to the field. See there? <coughs> Atia to the U. What is that? Father of theology. Okay, this patria here, this word is an old Greek word. It means family. Oh. Okay, the father, the fa fatherhood, the family. A, a, a family of the father. All right? The patria means the family. Okay? And Latin is a familia. Uh, fami the family of God. Now, when you've been born again, you're in the family of God, aren't you? You can't get out of it. Once you've been born, you've been born. You can't get unborn, period. I mean, if you're a Catholic and you really believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came down and died for you, that He rose again, and get rid of all that Catholic dogma, you can't believe that. If you believe it, you're not going to make it. But if you really believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, you repent of your sin and call upon him to save your soul, you get to go to heaven. That's it. Now, Mormonism, boy, that's a hard nut to crack. I'm going to tell you, how many of you ever tried to crack hickory nuts or real old wild walnuts? You can't hardly get them open. You tear the whole meat of the nut up trying to get in there. Blacksmiths used to make a special device, and it was about this, well, almost as long as that table, and it had a long handle on it, and in there was a, a little cup beat out by a blacksmith. And they would put this wild walnut or hickory nut in there, hickory nut or hickory nut, and they pulled out on that thing, and it would crush the whole outside of that shell. And you'd just pull the nut meat out of it right inside and pick the other stuff inside of it out. You tried to hit that with a hammer or something like that, that thing's hard like a rock. And the time you got through, you have nothing left. They devised that a long time ago. That was a hard nut to crack. The Mormons are a hard nut to crack. You make any progress, Brother Roger? Very slowly. Their idea of God is so foreign from the Bible that it's so hard. They believe in reincarnation. They believe everything under the sun except who God is. And there's only one of them. It's hard to lead them to the Lord. I may have done it once. I don't know for sure. I don't know because I just don't know. <laughs> because it's so confusing. Their idea of God is so confusing you don't know. They can be totally dead earnest. People can be dead earnest and go to hell. Isn't that right? Young lady, you come in here and listen to my Hebrew classes, and all of a sudden one day you were all un unhappy. You was all right. All the pastors told you were all right. The priest told you were all right, but you weren't all right. Well, you got to end the family of God. Now, is there people that believe in baptismal regeneration? Can you name me those people that believe that? Church of Christ. The Church of Christ is one of them. Witness. Yeah, yeah, the one that's Pentecostalism. Now, what do they believe? Roman Catholics. Yeah, Roman Catholics. You get all of them really do, because you're all of them baptize you for the original sin. Okay. Here is uh, the church over here. The church is a bride. Also, some of the church is the bride. Put it that way. What stands in the place of the family of God and the church? What is that barrier? What is it? You're saved. Why aren't you in the church? What's the doorway? What's one of the avenues? What is the barrier? What is it, Sharon? Do you know? Between the family of God and the church? Well, the church needs to be a real New Testament church. Yeah. Well, wait a minute, yeah, baptism. What is that? Baptizo. And that, that, you, that makes you a member of the church once you're baptized. We get, we get the name Baptist from that, okay? When we're saved, everybody that's saved is in the family of God, period. 
Everybody that's saved is in the family of God. I don't care where you came from, Pentecostal. If you got a Pentecostal saved, he gets saved, he's going to be in the family of God. Except that's a very confusing religion, isn't it? Because it's hyper-Armenian. You get a free will Baptist, which aren't Baptists at all. Period. They're not Baptists. They're Armenians. I never knew an Armenian that was a good theologian because they got God wrong. They got the whole act of plan of salvation wrong. Okay, here we go. You're saved. Everybody's saved, huh? Now, here is the church over here. Now, we have these people like the Church of Christ that believe in baptismal salvation and these oneness Pentecostals that believe baptismal salvation. And when you're baptized, you get baptized, you go where? They say you're in a church, aren't you? Now, did anybody ever get excluded from a church in the history of the Bible? The 18th chapter of Matthew is talking about what? Church this one. Kick them out. If they don't act right, whatever, get rid of them. How about in 1 Corinthians? Did Paul tell that church to kick somebody out of that church? Did he get kicked out of the family of God? No. What was he removed from? The fellowship of the church. Not from the family of God. You can't get out of the family of God. Once you've been born, the Holy Spirit seals you for the resurrection. Period. It's over with. There's nothing you can do to get unsaved. You can do things to lose your rewards, which we're going to look at tonight. We're talking about rewards and the gospel. Now the gospel is, in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, <clears throat> let's go back and look at that for a minute. How do you get into the family of God? How do you get into the family of God? It's not by baptism. As the Church of Christ say and as they want this. And the oneness that says you've got, you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus. You're name, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It won't work. Church of Christ say you have to be baptized by their authority. And they claim to go back to 33 A.D. You'll see that on some of their churches established 33 A.D. There's just about three years too short. The real churches were established in the beginning of Christ's ministry, not in 33 A.D., most people have the church started on the day of Pentecost, which is about three year and a half years too late. Did the church have a treasure in it before the day of Pentecost? Did the, Lord, did the church take the Lord's Supper before the day of Pentecost? Did it? Yep. Did the church baptize before the day of Pentecost? Yep. Did the church have gifts placed in it before the day of Pentecost? Yeah, what was the, what was the main gift? First gift placed in the church? Apostles. Apostles. All right. Now let's go and see what Paul says about the only way of salvation. How do you get into the patria to theu, the family of God? Familia. 1 Corinthians 15th chapter. Now I make unknown to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also received in which you also stand. You stand in the gospel? First of all, who's speaking? Brother Dick, who's speaking? Paul. Paul the apostle. Who's he speaking to? The church at Corinth. Almost all the New Testament letters are church letters. How to behave yourself. In, in 1 and Timothy, Timothy, it says how to behave yourself in the household of God, which is the church, the pillar and ground of the truth. Okay, the church. The church. The gospel, which I preach to you, which you also receive, and which you stand, by which you also are saved, Ephesians 2 and 8 says, For in grace you are having been saved. Now this is a, the, the Ephesian letter is a circular church letter. It's not to the church at Ephesus. It says that, but you'll look in there, it, that's in parentheses. It, it was sent out from Ephesus and copied from Ephesus, but it's a what we call a general epistle to all the churches. For in grace you are having been saved through faith, and that faith is not out of you. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is not by works. Anybody that's trying to work the way heaven is thumbing their nose and blaspheming God. Simple as that. Salvation is not a mixture of works and grace. It is not. It's straight by the works of self. It's straight by the works of Jesus Christ and Him only. By which you are saved if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Did some of these church members go off into heresy? 
Yeah, because they didn't believe. Not really. They didn't really believe. They did not believe. There was no real salvation. Some of them left. They're gone. They're no longer members of the church either, are they? You can get kicked out of a church. You can't kicked out, get kicked out of the family of God. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received from Christ, died for our sins according to what scriptures, Brother Dick? What scriptures? The Old Testament scriptures, these were all the prophecies. I think I had like 300 of them talking about Christ. I had written down. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried according to the scriptures. We're going to put all this in there according to the scriptures. Did the scriptures say he would be buried? Where was he going to be buried? In the grave of a rich man. Okay, that's what the Old Testament scripture says. How long would he be buried? Three days. And that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and the twelve, and after this he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. He goes on and tells you that, uh, that he became an apostle. Now let's go back. Uh, now what is the gospel? It's, this is, I preached in Nevada one time. It took me about six months to tell that church what the gospel was. They couldn't get it. They said the Bible was the gospel. And I said the Bible not the gospel. This is the short version right here. That's, that, that's, a, that's what you call a Reader's Digest version of the gospel right there. That Jesus Christ came according to the scriptures that he is God the Son. John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14. 1, and the word, the Jehovah flesh, he became and dwelt among us. That he was going to die for our sins. He's going to be raised for our justification. Simple as that. That's it. That's the gospel. Now anybody in any church can believe that if they get it right. If they get it right. Sometimes it is a what we call an accident. That it happened. I was saved in a Pentecostal church by accident. And by grace. Did just happen to be somebody in that church who knew what the gospel was when I went forward? And they were not interested in me at all. They never had anything to do with me. After the church, they came and gave me a Bible, but they said nothing to me when I went down to the altar. They gave me a Bible. Here, here's a Bible. I got under conviction of the Holy Spirit of God by reading God's Word. By reading God's Word. It just tore me up. My grandmother had died. This was 1961, the first part of the year, 1961. And uh, I went to church, and I was ready to be saved when I walked in that door. Didn't have anything to do with the preaching. They got up and started talking in tongues and raising canes, stopping their feet, amen, hallelujah, ho. Oh. <laughs> I mean, over and over and over. You know what I'm talking about, Pamela? Raise and Cain. And I just was under conviction so bad because of the Holy Spirit. I went down to the altar, and they kept on going on with their business. And my step ex, ex step grandmother, which was a wonderful woman, Mrs. Brown, came down there with me, and she said, Jimmy, what's wrong? I said, I think I need to be saved, but I don't know what saved means. I don't know what, how to do it, period. I don't know anything. And he says, well, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And I said, yeah, I believe that. She said, do you, are you a sinner? And I said, I sure am. I really feel terrible. And she said, well, ask God to forgive you on the merits of Jesus Christ and ask him to save your soul and then thank him for it. I don't know how she got that out of that church. I don't know where it came from because it sure didn't come from that pulpit, even though I love those people dearly and they meant a world to, the world to me. But boy, the day not preached the gospel. That just didn't do it. Just wasn't there. All right, now let's go to the third chapter of Corinthians. Now we've got what the gospel is and how you get saved and how you get in the, in the family of God. Baptism doesn't get you into the family of God. Baptism will get you into hell many times. Baptism can really throw you a big curve because if you're, if you're baptized for salvation, you're not saved. 
you going in a even if you're sprinkled, if they pour water on, if you rontizo you, in Greek word, if they nipto you, pour water on you, or if they baptizo you, dip you, immerse you, even though you're immersed, and when you are baptized, you're baptized unto the death of Christ. I always say, by <clears throat> New Hope Missionary Baptist Church, Fish Lake Valley Baptist Church, and Valley Baptist Church, by the authority of all these things, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism and raised in newness of life. That had nothing to do with salvation. First time, the first thing I ask them before I do that, have you repented of your sin? He asked the Lord to save your soul. You saved? Yeah. When do you do this? That's what I ask them before I baptize them. Right up in front of everybody, I do that. And then I baptize them by the authority of the church, not by my authority, but by the authority of the church. The, church, the authority of the church invested in me that I baptize with. <clears throat> now, what does baptism do? What does baptism do? Let's look and see. We're baptized unto Christ, aren't we? By his commands. That's the first. Baptism is the very first act of righteousness that you can do after you've been saved. You should do that. You should be baptized. And you should be baptized by a scriptural New Testament church, just not anything that walks along. <clears throat> Verse number 10, 1 Corinthians 3 and 10. According to the grace of God which given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But, each, but let each man be careful how he builds upon it. What is the foundation? What foundation did Paul lay down? Matthew 16 and 18. Jesus talking to his church and Peter. He said, you are Peter. You are Peter, Petros, a little stone, a little pebble, but upon this giant foundational stone I shall be building my church and the gates of hell shall not wrestle her down. And in this we find out that the foundation is Christ. Who is the rock of Israel? Jesus. Jesus is the rock of Israel. He's the rock that followed Israel in the background. Who is uh, Jehovah my rock? That's Jesus. Over and over and over again. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid that foundation. I laid the foundation which was Christ. And another is building upon it. Let each man be careful how he builds upon it. He's talking about starting churches. <clears throat> For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What foundation did he lay? He called out his assembly. What does the word a church mean as we see it? Church is a bad u u word, isn't it? It's not really a scriptural word. What is it? Ecclesia or assembly. Okay? Ecclesia or assembly. Now the word uh, synagogue, synagogue, is the place of going together, and the Hebrew equivalent for that is moed. The place of going together. That's the church house. Now church house is not the church. The church is the assembly that meets in a church house. And for hundreds of years... Churches, assemblies didn't have church houses. Until Constantine the Great married the church and the state, they didn't basically have church houses. They assembled in somebody's home or in a cave or in a, in a gathering like a whatever. Synagogue. They would meet. Sometimes whole synagogues were converted and they'd use the synagogue. They'd go there and, and have a meeting there. And the synagogue was kind of open air situation too, wasn't it? <clears throat> For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid is Jesus Christ. Verse now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. What are we talking about wood, hay, and stubble? These are man-made churches and man-made assemblies. Be careful what you do. How should we judge assemblies? When I taught church history, I taught the 11 essential elements of a New Testament church. What does it teach? What does it teach? What, are their what do they believe? 
These are very important things. If a man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. Upon it what? That scriptural foundation. How many unscriptural churches are there in the world? Most of them. The devil is in the religious business, isn't he? Now we're talking we're not talking about lost people here, are we? We're talking about saved people that are going to church, but they're going to the wrong churches and they're not going to have any rewards. Woof. They're gone. What's baptism do? What does baptism do? Jerry, what's it do? It's an act of obedience, and it's a doorway to following the Lord. And it's a doorway, it's your ticket to rewards. Over here, the family of God, you get saved. I don't know, I think there's people that are probably in the family of God. Over here in the tribulation period, they're going to die as martyrs. People that have died as martyrs that are really saved. I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of people in the Middle East right now dying for their Christian so-called faith. But what does the world call a Christian? The world says Islam is the number two religion in the world. Is that correct or not? Is that correct or not? Islam is the number two religion in the world. It's number one religion in the world. What do they call Christian? Mormons? Catholics? Marianites, Coptics, Mormon, Jehovah Witnesses. These are all Christians, according to them. And if you add all of those together, Christianity is barely number one. Maybe Islam is the number one. There's 1.5 billion Islamic people, Muslims in the world. There aren't that many Christians. And out of those, I doubt if 1% of them are, are New Testament churches with scriptural baptism. You see what a good job the devil does? You see what a good job? If the devil can't keep you from being saved, he'll keep you from being serving the Lord in the scriptural church. That's very important. Let's go on and see just a little bit about it. Now, if a man, this man here, what is this man? This is a saved man, isn't it? These aren't lost people. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be what? Saved, yet so as through fire. Here's where your Catholics get this purgatory business. This purgatory business. You know, these are saved people that did not go to scriptural churches. They did their own thing. And that's a, this is real. This is a real, this is sorry, isn't it? Isn't this a tragedy? This is a tragedy. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, this is not what it's used. Does the Spirit of God dwell in you? The Holy Spirit dwells in you as a saved person, doesn't it? Every person in the family of God, what we call the household of God, oikos, or the family of God, every one of them is indwelt by the Spirit of God. But what about the church? How and what way does the Holy Spirit work in the church? How's the Holy Spirit work in the church? He leads. Huh? He leads. he leads. And in the Old Testament, what is the type of the church in the Old Testament? What do we have as the type of the church? It's right up on the board, the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the type of Christ, number one. Secondarily, it's a type. It's a dual, double type. It's a type of the church. Let's look at that for just a minute. <clears throat> I wish I had that thing turned over here just a little bit more. Maybe I'll do that. <clears throat> right up here is the tabernacle. Out here is where the camps of Israel are. They have a, a three different stations or, or, or four different stations. There are four flags that go around here representing each of the three tribes. Uh, we have Reuben, we have Simeon, we have Gad over here. We have uh, Issachar, Judah, and Zebulun here. 
We have Diane Asher and Naftali here. We have Ephraim, Manassas, and Benjamin here. And in close here, we have the servants, the priestly group that minister here. Now, outside here, we have people that are gathered around this, uh, this, this type of the church. A lot of people out here. Now, this is a type of Christ because we see his righteousness. We see the altar here that's right there. The altar is his sacrifice. The, if you're in the family of God, you get in this circle. You made it here. Okay? You made the sacrifice. But what is next after the sacrifice? This is the labor. And what did they do to the priest? They dipped every priest the first time. Okay? Now, the Lord told us in New Testament times that we are priests unto him, aren't we? A kingdom of priests. All right, now, this is the church here. There's five pillars in front of here. Five is the number of what? Grace. Grace. We have 48 boards around here, and the, 40, and the boards are made out of wood, and wood is a type of what in the Bible? Wood is a type of what? Humanity. And that's a dual type. Jesus was human, and yet he was God. He was all God, all man, all at the same time. We have 48 boards. They're standing on silver sockets, which is redemption. These boards, we, we could say Christ was God. He was, he was uh, and God and man, these are, are covered with gold. Now, secondarily, these 48 boards that are up there are covered. They were boards. They're humans that are covered with gold. We're all covered by the blood of Christ. But we also have had the, the sacrifice, and we also have baptism. And in, in the Lord's church, and the first room in this church, now it's all brown looking. It doesn't look like anything special from the outside. But when you walk inside, it's gold everywhere. And the first thing you see over there to the right is what? The table of showbread. And over to the left is a candlestick, which is a type of the Holy Spirit in the church, illuminating the church. And that table of showbread is a, is a type of the Lord's Supper in the church. And then we have an altar of incense here. And that's prayer. If you want to get serious, go to church and pray as a congregation in the New Testament church. That is serious prayer. This is a holy place. That's the church today. Over here in this little cube is a holy of holies. It's quite a, like heaven itself. And right here we have access to heaven. Direct access. Why? Because we're following Lord, the Lord in his, in his way, according to his pattern, according to his pattern. Now let's go back again and look a little bit more about this first Corinthians. Are you learning something tonight? Just a little bit? Do you know that you're the temple of God? Who's speaking? Paul. Paul. Who's he writing to? Church. Church. Now each one of them, they, people say you're a temple of God. You, each one of us is not the temple of God. The church is the temple of God. People use that, and they use so. People uses use applications of scripture so much that people don't know what the interpretation of scripture is. The interpretation of scripture is where two or three gather together in my authority. What do you have? A New Testament church. It's not talking about two or three people hanging around together and praying. That's not a church. If there's only two or three people together, you can have a church, if it's a scriptural church. How many people had to be in a place, in one place for a synagogue to be established, Brother Dick? How about it, Brother Roger? Ten. Ten. Jesus lowered the number. He said, where there are two or three gathered together in my name, by my authority, as a church, I will be in them, with them. Now, the Lord Spirit dwells in us. We're convicted of all of our sins and whatever, you know. But the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the leadership of the Holy Spirit in his Shekinah glory is the church. Church is very special to the Lord. What is this right here? Shekinah glory. Wherever that thing rested for that 40 years in the wilderness out there, wherever that, Holy, wherever that Shekinah glory of God led them, they rested there and that Shekinah rested right over that mercy seat, didn't it? First John 2 and 2 says, for he is our propitiation, he is a helosmos, he is our covering. Right there is where the sins are forgiven. 
that holy of holies. Jesus Christ took his blood and put it in heaven. It was in heaven that sprinkled on that real Ark of the Covenant in heaven. That was that one was a type of right there. A facsimile of it. That tabernacle moved and moved and moved. That's a type of the church in the church age where as we move and wherever we go. Now we could go in this and I could teach you that for a long, long time. And all of those little articles and everything and whichever one of them, all the bars that held it together, and all the coverings and everything else, we won't go into that right now because that's not the subject, but we refer to it. Where two or three gather together in my name is what? That's a church. That's not the family of God. Two or three people can gather and pray, can't they? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing unscriptural about that. But to be gathered together as a church, you have to have it has to be the body of Christ there. The body of Christ. Church is the body of Christ. We are individuals that are indwelt by the Spirit of God. Now it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? The church at Corinth is the temple of God. And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. You are. As a cumulative. There is no such thing as a universal church. It's all local, visible assemblies. In the end, the rapture is going to be, this church is going to be raptured, but all the saved are going to be raptured too. Now, how many guests are going to be at the wedding in heaven? Billions, Billions of guests. How many brides are there? One. There's going to be a lot of guests at the wedding. There's going to be a lot of people there that their, that their, their, their works went poof, gone. That's sad, isn't it? Because some people build their foundation, their, their works upon the wrong foundation. That's a sad situation. That's a trick of the devil. But I'm glad that they're going to be there. I am thankful for every person that's ever saved in period. And I'm going to tell you who's going to get credit for all those people getting saved. You know who it's going to get credit? Who's the administrator of God's church and God, of the world in, today? The church. If the true New Testament churches here weren't here, there would never be one true gospel ever preached, period. Zero. There would be none if it wasn't for that church. Now let's go back. And the two and six. Ton copionta giergon de proton ton carpon metalabane. The one laboring, that's the one beating himself up, is hard labor. Brother Dick, you ever work real hard? Felt like you've been through the ringer? Somebody beat you up when you went home? Nope. Yeah, that's what that word laboring there means. The one having labored, the one laboring. He is a uh, Georgon, Georgon. That word is really beautiful. The name Georgia comes from that, by the way. The name Georgia comes out of this word. And uh, it means to watch and to till and to constantly observe. When you plant a seed in the ground, can you just walk off and leave it? You can, can't you? But some bird may come up, you got to get out there and chase all the animals out of the field, whatever. You know, you, you're going to have problems, trespassings, whatever. You've got to watch it, don't you? A city, the word eder in Hebrew, what does it mean, brother? Uh, it means a fortified, watched city. A watched place. Every farm has to be watched and tilled. This means to, uh, to a tiller of the earth and a watcher. It is bindingly necessary, look at that word day, first of the fruits to receive, to share with. Now who's this talking about? Sharon, you don't have your Amplified Bible with you, do you? All right. Do you have the other one? You've got that one there. you got that. What's it say there? All right, the hardworking farmer should be the first one to share the rewards of the crops. Is that true or not? 
He should be. Who's this talking about? The workers in the church? Is that what it's talking about? You know, <clears throat> in modern day churches, uh, we lost so much. We just absolutely just walked off and left the Bible in so many ways. Uh, those that were paid, who got paid in the churches? Who got paid in the early churches? Just the pastors. Pastors, who else? Oh, widows. Widows, who else? Deacons. Pastors, deacons, teachers, all of these. They all got paid. Now we just pay the top of the crop. I mean, the very, the very top, don't we? We don't pay the deacons. Deacons work, but they were paid. Originally, they were paid. The widows were enrolled. Widows that were widows indeed. You know, they had to have requirements. They had to be. They had to be teachers. They had to be workers in the church. They had to visit people. And if they re met these requirements, they were enrolled like they were ordained as widows. Okay, and they were paid. They were put on a salary, so to speak. Two and verse seven. Noé, <coughs> Ho, Lego, Dose, Gar, Sui, Ho, Curios, Sin, Essen, and Pasin. This means uh, to put your mind on. Second person singing a present imperative active. Put your mind on what I say. This word noose, that's what's the, the, the root of it. It's noio here. But it says, put your mind on what I say. What I say and continue to say. You shall freely give. For you shall freely give to you the Lord. And then we have the word sinesin. That word there literally means to send together, to stand together and to send together. Understanding in all things. Is the church the one that's supposed to, let's go to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I'll just quote it to you, so to speak. Here we have the church gathered with Jesus. And he says, uh, uh, you're going to be cast out into the world. Having gone out into the world. Now we always say what the Great Commission is, go ye therefore. That's unscriptural, and you're not going to find it in Greek at all. It says, after you've been cast out, what do you do? What is the command there? What is the commission? Make disciples. Make disciples. What do you do with the, the disciples? You baptize them. Get them into the church. You make disciples, you get them saved, and then you baptize them, and, and they go into the church where they start working. That's where you work, is in the church. No freelancing out there. Business is just it. Okay. What I say, you shall freely give to you the Lord understanding to send together in all things. This Shekinah glory is going to lead these people, this church, into all truths. Make disciples, <coughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them what? Teaching them to guard with their lives all things that I have taught you. Guard with your lives. Why do they have to guard with their lives that? It's bindingly necessary. Day, day. It's bindingly necessary to guard with your lives all things. Because here in 2 Timothy we find out there's bad people coming to church. In 1 Corinthians we have bad people in the church. Some of them they have to get rid of. And we have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John we have bad people in the church. And he said, get rid of them. Don't fool with them. Get, get them out of the church. Don't let them teach. They're heretics. You're destroying the church. Jude says, he, talks, he calls them the Acts of the Apostates. Book of James. Hebrews. James was written. Hebrews was written. Hebrews was written about the Judaizers. The Judaizers were, we have Judaism from out and Judaizers from the end of the church. The church's problem in the beginning was not the Roman Empire. It was the Jews. Wanted to kill them. What was Paul's problem? Jews. The Jews be ceased being the administrator of God's, t of God's kingdom and became the administrator of, a of the kingdom of Satan. They became the devil's missionaries. They became the devil's missionaries, and they're still doing that today. Still doing that today. 
Now, let's go on to verse number eight. We're going to quit right there. Meno mane. Esun Christon. Ege ger menon. Ek necron. Ek spermatos. David. Kara to yongalia mu. Remember Jesus Christ. This is a predicate of Tuesday, by the way. Remember Jesus Christ having been raised out of the dead ones. He's talking about the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, verse on. Out of the seed, out of the spermatos of David, according to the scriptures, one. He came according, according to the gospel of me. What was the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 6, 7. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is that Jesus Christ came according to the scriptures, that he died according to the scriptures, that he was raised according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. And you believe that gospel, you get in the family of God. But if you ever want to serve the Lord, you get through scriptural baptism, you go on to church and start doing it. And maybe if you really serve real hard, you might be in the bride of Christ. I can't guarantee you that in no way. That means if you give it all. Because that bride... It says in the book of Revelation, what did the bride do, Brother Roger? She has what? Made herself ready. You don't put yourself in the family of God, do you? But the bride has made herself ready. That's middle voice, direct middle. She has made herself ready. Why? Because of voluntary servitude, because of voluntary chastity, the bride did. She separated herself from the whole world. Brother Roger. No. Yeah, yes. So we're not saved by <coughs> works. We're no. saved by grace. Uh -huh. but, as, but there is a place for works. War, that's right. Which is when, in the church. Is, in the church. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in the church, you can get rewards. The greatest reward is what? Being ruling and reigning with do you do you hear what I said ruling and reigning with Christ? Where's the bride going to be? Right next on the throne with her husband next to him. That's where you can be. That's where you can be. But what it cost you? What's it going to cost you? What's it cost the Lord? Everything. Now that doesn't mean quit working because you can't get there. Because the rewards other places aren't there. There's many guests at the wedding. I think being a guest at the wedding is going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. How many brides get married? One. How many grooms are there? One. How many guests? Many. They'll feast at the table. But that bride is special. I'm telling you. Now most of the evangelical world don't know anything about what I'm talking about tonight. They would totally miss it and disagree with it if they did understand it. But that's the way it is. That's the truth from the scriptures. That's why people think they can lose their salvation because they can get kicked out of church and the church is, the, is to most people is salvation. It is not salvation. The church is a place of service after salvation and baptism. Any question, Brother Dick? No. No one else? Nothing? Pamela? Anybody? Sharon, you got a question? No. Brother Roger. All right. Let's just be dismissed and go out and do something eternal. Uh, Sharon, you want to dismiss us in prayer, please? Okay. Well, Father, we just thank you for the light for just shining on your word that we can understand. And, Lord, I just ask that you just implant it in our hearts and in our minds. 